It is the night of May the 16th, 1943. In all the skies of Europe at war, one squadron only is flying. Enemy coast ahead. Their task, to breach the great dams of the Ruhr Valley. Tonight, they are 617 Squadron. Tomorrow, the world will know them as... New Zealander, Les Monroe, I'd like to have him. Oh, and Joe McCarthy, he's great. All the American. I'm quite interested just to find out the steps which led up to you being picked for the most elite squadron of all time. Well, now that's a, that, that's a bit of a, uh, uh, what, uh, unresolved subject. Um, I volunteered and, and the, 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 all the squadrons in five group were invited to uh, uh, volunteer. They called for volunteers from crews that had uh, nearing completion of their first tour or starting their second. And that's how I come to become the 617. I think that, that applied to most of them. I think there was a few. Uh, that Gibson might have selected himself, like from the squadron where he was CO, uh, on 106 I think it was. Uh, but in the main I think they're nearly all volunteers. They weren't, they weren't, weren't posted uh, automatically. So, so um, in, in, terms of be, in terms of being a, a volunteer, would, would you not have had to have heard of what was going on? Uh, did we given the option and, and told this is a, a there's, there's a new project underway and we need volunteers or did no, you know I, specifically well, I, from memory it was just word like something that uh, they uh, called for, volunteers were called for to form a new squadron to attack uh, well, yeah to attack a uh, a special target without any information being given as to what the target was. There were, yeah, there were no, uh, very little information given in that respect. So I think um, in my case I discussed it with my crew and we decided to volunteer. I, I, I firmly believe that, that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the Gibson picking the crews was, was, was not factual. Okay. Yeah. So the bit when he says, and the Kiwi! Les Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's uh, yeah. now. Well, you see, the first film. I think a lot of, the, well, the the type of bomb and all that sort of thing was still under wraps. And it remained so for thirty years. You see, so uh, I think you show the the uh, the film does show the the shape or the early shape, which was a spherical. Shape rather than the canister type, mm. uh, and they weren't allowed. Or they, they the film wasn't allowed to show the the upkeep in, in the in the canister form. Right. See, so it was now. This is that's something that Peter Jackson will will put right, mm -hmm. and he, he said he's going to stick to uh, uh, facts as far as as closely as possible. So. And the the barrel form or the, the, the form of the, bat, the bomb which is eventually used it was irregular in shape so that when it gyrated and spun like a like a gyroscope it always had an even surface to bounce surface yeah, to bounce yeah, yeah, yeah. Water. it was just like an ordinary uh, preserved fruit tin you know really but you know uh, how many times how many thousand times magnified. Uh, uh, no, it was just a, yeah, it was a it was just a straight cylindrical roll uh, in in form, and uh, with a couple of flanges or flange, flanges at each end, with the the uh, attached to a motor in the nose of the aircraft by an ordinary belt. Uh, 
by, by, and, and revolved by uh, the use of a, uh, a marine engine. Four and a half. He was four and a half horsepower, something like that. Mm. Yeah. And um, it was attached with legs under the plane. Yeah, it had uh, caliper arms, two arms like joined together like this with a drum in the middle of, middle of that, and that the, the drum, the drum at the at the at the join at the join of the of the caliper arms would come down like this. It was uh, had it was driven, driven by a belt from that to a to um, a flange like uh, the yeah, uh, would have been a track on the on the end of the bomb that uh, by which it was revolved. When I when I when I read about the eventual design with these legs holding the bomb, I was thinking what about those who? What about those who are forced to return? How do you land when you've got a bomb under you with legs? You'd have to. You'd have to shed the load. No. 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 You could still land. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 Providing you were within the all up permitted weight to land. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, there was no problem with uh, you know some people, and one or two authors said that uh, that. Um, Monroe disobeyed orders in landing with the bomb on, but no orders were given that we had to jettison none at all. And uh, I found no problem with them. Providing the, you, 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 all that bait, bomb, plane, petrol, all that sort of thing, was within a given um, maximum, no problem with landing. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, we had a pretty good crew and they used to get on pretty well together. There was never any conflict between any members of the crew with each other. Um, w w were you all um, officers, so you could all, you know, drink together? Because I know in some of the no, squadrons there was some sort of segregation. When we first went to six one seven, the only officers were uh, we were Jock Rummels and Navigator and myself, and the rest were all NCOs. Mm -hmm. But gradually over time, they got uh, promoted or commissioned. Yeah. Yeah. And um, ha had you met Guy Gibson before no. the squadron? No, never met him. No. I didn't even know of him until we uh, uh, all arrived at the at Scampton uh, prior to the actual raid itself. In you know, in, in preparation for uh, for the training and for training for the dams raid. Um, no, I hadn't. I hadn't. Uh, I hadn't met any of them before. Oh, well, except for the two crews that went from '97. That was Joe McCarthy, the American, that served on uh, the RCAF, and uh, the other one was David Maltby. They all, those are the three that went from '97 squad to form part of 617. Right. And um, what operations was was it? Uh, was it '97 squadron? That you were in before. Mm. Um, what operations had you been um, involved in immediately prior to the, well, uh, joining Six One Seven? Yeah, well, main, mainly uh, uh, main bomber force operations on, on Germany, and uh, well, one or two, I think, there were several on Italy. Uh, but they were at that time. Uh, in the end of 92, 93, the weather wasn't too good and a lot of it was, uh, uh, we flew there and back over cloud and uh, at that stage they were experimenting with with uh, PFF dropping flares on the, on the, crowd, on the clouds mm -hmm. and then the rest of the main force would bomb the coloured markers on the, how successful was it, I've never heard. I don't think it was extremely successful, but the idea was to uh, affect or to to destroy the morale of the of the German public and create uh, you know a dissension create and, uh, and create uh, concern by the population and, and and of course that would in turn affect morale. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that stage that, that that was one of these. The successors that came out of the uh, 
the dams raid was the fact that it uh, raised the morale of the English people, who literally had, had been down a bit because the war wasn't going too well for England and the Allies. And uh, that uh, the success of, success of the of the raid on the Mona and the Ada, particularly, had uh, played a great part, a substantial part, in uh, in building morale up. Mm. There were two hundred and two, I think, two hundred and two or four, two hundred and four billion tons of water in all three dams: yeah. the Mona, the Ada, and the Sorpe. Barnes Wallace, did he present to you all? in a room uh, the, the idea or did he present to Guy Gibson who then who then explained? No, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Do you remember meeting Barnes Wallace? Yeah, well, yeah. Casually at the time I met him and talked to him for quite a while in 68, 1968, the first reunion of him. But uh, no, at the time of the uh, the up when we were briefed, we didn't uh, we were, didn't have the opportunity to talk to him personally. I think he took part in the briefing of it to a certain extent. But uh, he was a rather aloof from from the you know plan for the uh, uh, briefing of these crews and what was it, what what we had to do and what the weapon or the upkeep was like and all that sort of thing. So he, had a bit, he was sort of there in the background, without playing a leading role in the, in the briefing process. A, ma a major requirement was to build up your low flying skills. Yeah. Had you um, been involved in any low flying before uh, joining 6-1? No, not really. Um, no, we didn't do, right up until that period we hadn't done any authorised low flying, put it that way. And I mean it was a court martial offence if you did that do low flying without it being authorised. Uh, but we embarked on, what, six weeks of low flying uh, in the training period. And I think most of the crews enjoyed that pretty, you know, the opportunity to low fly uh, when it was authorised. And pilots particularly uh, took a great deal of satisfaction in that part of their training. And um, was there a point in time when the low flying practice turned into low flying over lakes, reservoirs? Well, yeah, um, it wasn't that long. Uh, so almost at the start of our training, we'd fly over the, the Dermot Water or the Upping Reservoir and the lakes and the uh, the dams and, and uh, in the in the, uh, the lakes district um, and some, some Colchester's and uh, a number of other areas where we used the dams to train uh, train over, and uh, well, so it was. Uh, we undertook the flying over the dams fairly quickly, fairly soon after it was started training. Okay. And I think I think when the when the this it was a, actually a period of only two months, was it not? Of training, but see, training to yeah. Zero hour. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't know how best to describe it. You know, from training to the operation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a tra yeah a training period right through. Uh, except when we dropped the uh, inert bombs as a trial, March to March, April, May. It was about six weeks training. Uh, very little more. And uh, no, that was right March. To April to May, yeah. It'd be about six months, six weeks of training. So we didn't have a great deal, but that was intensive flying. Mm. You know, flying two or three times a day, or depending on what sort of training it was. But you do cross country flights just about every day. Uh, October 1940, I think I volunteered, yeah. That was the last month of the Battle of Britain? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, and then then uh, I ended. I volunteered then on October 40, but I didn't enter into the air force until uh, June, I think it was. I've forgotten the name. Uh, Where were you trained? Well, New Plymouth. That uh, started in Bell Block, what they call Bell Block in New Plymouth, mm -hmm. and then went to Canada.
Oh, okay. And trying to, I was in Canada, Saskatoon for, uh, December three, nearly four months. Okay. And which planes did you start on? The Tiger Moss and the DH-82. And then the Cessna trains in Canada. Mm -hmm. It was... Was it, was it the job of the navigator to tell you where you were, how high you were, or did you instinctively know? No, 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 the, you, the, 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 that was a pilot's responsibility. Mm -hmm. He had to watch the, uh, the altimeter, but then when, when we had difficulty in flying over water on a moonlight night when there was haze about, so they, uh, and the fact that the, uh, the altimeters were barometric autopilot was subject to change at sea level pressure, so they came up with this idea of having a uh, Aldous lamp and then those, and then the, those of the uh, underneath the bomb, in front of the bomb compartment, the yeah, bomb compartment, and one by the tail, and they, when they were switched on, they'd intersect it at 60 feet. So they had the, in my case, the flight engineer. Uh, when, when, we want, when the pilot wanted his uh, altimeter checked, he would ask for the lights to be switched on, and the, either the bomber, the, uh, na the, uh, the navigator or the flight engineer would look down in the bulb of, his, of the cockpit and peer down and he would direct the pilot to go fly higher or lower. And when, when he said right, the pilot then adjusted his, bar, his altimeter to, to 60 feet. So he could then, he knew he could rely on it then to be reading correctly. So that was the principle of the, what do they call it? The two-stage amber, I think. No, no, no. The um, spotlight altimeter calibrator. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, on on the day of the operation, what 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 were your what were your feelings on the, on that day? Was it just another operation to you, or did you have an did you have an impression of, of the um, of the importance of it? Was it was it? No, no. We, we well, we weren't aware of what the target was. Until we walked in the briefing room at about what, four o'clock, half past four, I think, on the, on the afternoon. You're going to attack the great dams of Western Germany. <laughs> Here are your targets. Here's the murder dam. That's the Ada. And there's the Sorpe, all just east of the Ruhr. Now we shall attack in three formations. The first will take the Myrna Dam as its first target, then carry on to the Ada. That will be nine aircraft in three waves. The second formation will consist of five aircraft. Joe McCarthy, Byers, Barlow, Rice and Munro. And, uh, but I think the, most, the reactions of most of the crew was not so much about the taking the dams themselves, but as the, the route that we had to fly in, which was mainly in the Ruhr, along the Ruhr Valley and, uh, oh, and and that was that created a bit of concern because of the it was heavily defended. Mm -hmm. And you knew that? Mm -hmm. You knew it was heavily defended and yeah, 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 yeah. So that that, uh, that was probably the only concern of most of the crew, yeah. Was the route that we had to take. Because yeah. mm -hmm. like, a lot of trips and uh, you know and uh, flying over the Ruhr Valley, which was the main industrial area in munitions manufacturing area of, of, of Germany, they, it was fairly heavily defended, and that was um, a bit of a downside to the operation itself. Mm -hmm. And um, have you uh, spent any time talking with Peter Jackson? Uh, in, in his preparation for the new film? Uh, about a year, two years, nearly, it shows you how time flies. Really? About two years ago I had a half a day with him in Wellington, uh, just chatting on about various factors in the, uh, in the preparation of the dam, uh, in the preparation for the, for the, of the uh, new film. I was talking to somebody today and they, he, was, he was either on wireless or TV in the last couple of days where he was talking about these uh, uh, full-scale Lancasters in mold form. Mm -hmm. 
you know, copied it from the, the original. Peter Jackson said, and now I'm not quite sure which way the story went. It should have either had five rivets and it had six or vice versa. But in Peter Jackson's mind, he knew exactly how many rivets were actually in that panel. They went back and checked that the guy actually had put one or the other way around. Too few rivets in this panel. But they went and used that Lancaster. Yeah. They were considering at one point, yeah. uh, Peter Jackson was actually con seriously considering yeah. taking the front off the building oh, okay. and pulling the Lancaster out. But they didn't do that, no. which would cost a bomb anyway. Uh, his patent yeah, makers were able to work on the air. Peter uh, Richard, Richard Taylor, the, the, the boss of Weta Workshops, uh, I was speaking to him in Auckland uh, in March and I gathered from him that it was being stored in Wellington in a mm. warehouse in Wellington but somebody said yesterday that they thought it was in, they were stored in the wire wrapper which would be hid to or down I think. Uh, so I don't know, I'm not quite sure which yeah. is right. In, in view of the new film, what, what do you hope most comes out of the new film? Oh, I, I, all I hope is that, and, uh, is that as factual as possible, uh, you know, things like Gibson being at an answer show and seeing the spotlights shown on the uh, rather pretty girls on the stage, where you got the idea of the oldest lamps, so that didn't happen, he, would, he, would never, he never had time to get off the station because he's too busy formulating uh, operations, uh, procedures and that sort of thing. So that was something that didn't happen. The other thing was, uh, as an England one, uh, yeah, that was one thing. Uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, there was one quite significant one. But, uh, oh, there was a of course. He's, uh, they, he said they're definitely he's going to stick to the name. Come here or high water. Uh, all these do good as the PC people say, no, you can't use the word. Uh, but he said, no, he's going to stick. You know, things like that. He said, these, those are facts, and, and, and um, I'm not going to change them. And because th that word was part of, it was part of the campaign, it was a code word as well as the name of Guy Gibson's dog. Yeah, it was a code word. That's right. That's right. You can't alter history in that respect. I didn't believe a word you said, but now you can sell me a pink elephant. <laughs> 